Hi, I'm John Pomeroy, um, animation producer and um, artist, painter, illustrator, and great to be seeing all of you. And uh, um, I'll talk to you briefly about my career and uh, what I'm currently doing. I started at Disney Studios back in 1973 as an uh, animation trainee. I got my... I first started getting excited about animation when I was about 10 years old. Uh, I started making puppets. Uh, marionettes and puppets kind of led me to animation. And um, one summer I decided I'm going to make an exact replica of the Pinocchio puppet. And I went to the LA Public Library to get some reference. And I came across a book called The Art of Walt Disney. And this book was written back in 1941 during the golden age of Disney animation. They were just finishing Snow White, Pinocchio, doing Bambi, Fantasia, and Dumbo. And I read the book, and I forgot about the puppet, and just kept reading the book over and over, and I got hooked. I got bit by this bug to become involved in the animation industry. So one thing led to another. I got into um, art school, went to Art Center College of Design, and provided a portfolio that finally got me into Disney Studios. And they were just beginning their animation trainee program. This is February of 1973. I remember the day and the hour when I started there. Now, I can't talk about Disney without having to do a drawing. So I'm going to do a drawing for you right now. So one of the first characters that I started to learn to draw I actually did one of my first tests using mouth here. Well, when it comes to drawing and designing a character, it's probably one of the Starting at uh, Disney Studios in 73, they had what's called the uh, animation trainee program. So it was on a month-to-month -month probation period. So I did my first test. Now, interestingly, I went when I went to the Disney Studios, I wanted to be a background artist. I had no interest in actually animating. That was not my priority. Background painting, because I loved painting. I wanted to paint the types of backgrounds that I saw in Pinocchio and Bambi and Dumbo. So. I told them when I was hired, I want to get in the, in the background department. He said, well, you'll be a better background artist if you learn the basic principles of animation. That way you'll paint, not as a solo artist, but as a team member in moving the story forward. We want people who can contribute their talents as part of a, a collected effort because animation is a collaborative art form. Everybody kind of works arm in arm together to make the best possible story on screen. I said, and I told them, I'll do anything you guys want me to do as long as I can land in the background department. And so they assigned me to an animator uh, by the name of Eric Larson. And Eric Larson was a member of the, a group of animators called the Nine Old Men. These were the nine trusted animators that did all of the supervising of the great animation and all the features that Disney did. And um, he was te teaching me the basic principles of animation. And when I saw my first pencil test, my first fledgling animation, I got bit by the bug. I thought, this is, this is like being God. I'm creating something from nothing. And from that point on, threw away the paintbrushes, gave up the idea of wanting to be a background artist. I wanted to be an animator, creating these life forms on paper. 
And that started me, and it's still with me today. I mean, next year will be my 50th year in the animation industry. So I've been in it probably longer than some of your parents have been <laughs> alive. It's an art form that has great longevity. Uh, there was an animator by the name of Grim Natwick who was the creator of Betty Boop and Popeye, and he worked on uh, Snow White. And this guy died at his desk drawing at the age of 101. So it's like he started when he was 14. So we're talking about decades upon decades, almost a 90-year run of being in the animation industries. So it's not like pro football or being a ballet dancer where you have maybe 12 or 15 good years of professional, you know, in that, in that area. You can be in animation your entire life. And it's, to me, I mean, there's no better art form. I, like they say, you've, you never work a day in your life if you love what you're doing. So currently, I am now working on Warner Brothers. They're doing a feature with Porky and Daffy. <laughs> so I'm having a blast. And I'm also working on a, a, another project that's kind of a secret project with Disney. So I'm, the work just keeps coming. So I want to show you, can I show the, this is, um, my demo reel, it lasts about eight minutes, of the, some of the highlights of things that I've worked on that I've helped produce and contributed to in the last almost 50 years. You mean I, I can't ever bounce again? Never. <laughs> Never? Best. So do I, Ru. I do too. Me too. Of course, we all do. Don't you agree, Rabbit? Oh, all right. I guess I like the old Tigger better too. Great idea. Now, uh, what, what, what can we use for bait? Oh, they'll eat anything. Yeah, I know. I've got it. My perfume, remember? They followed the scent right into the elevator. And I'll slam the door. And will that make Medusa mad? Brutus, you, did you let that little brat escape again? You're too soft. Whap, whap. <laughs> hey, Penny, that's not bad. <laughs> You're gonna come out smiling. You're gonna come out smiling. You're gonna come out smiling if you stay with me. Let's go find that truck. Flame so hot to roast a turkey in a mouth so terrible it could devour a man and spit him 20 leagues. Stay close. <laughs> uh, Elliot, would you, would you like a little belt? Huh? <laughs> yes, I would move, but Timothy has pneumonia. He can't even get out of bed. You must move to a place where it'll be safe from the plow. Please, there must be another way. There is no other way. I must bid you good evening, Mrs... Uh... Mrs. Brisby. Brisby? Mrs. Jonathan Brisby? Why, yes. He was my husband. Dragon's Lair, a fantasy adventure where you become a valiant knight on a quest to rescue the fair princess from the clutches of an evil dragon. 
You control the actions of a daring adventurer finding his way through the castle of a dark wizard who has enchanted it with treacherous monsters and obstacles. In the mysterious caverns below the castle, your odyssey continues against the awesome forces that oppose your efforts to reach the Dragon Slayer. Lead on, adventurer. Your quest awaits. One herd had only a single baby, their last hope for the future. <laughs> and they called him Littlefoot. Here I am. Robin Hood says to Little John, this sheriff is a real bimbo. I would say we knock him off and take the gold. Not for ourselves, but uh, we'll give it to the poor worthless suckers who got took in the first place. Hey, boss, where do you get that stuff? What kind of hood is this guy anyway, giving dough to the pool without taking his cut? I like this story, Mr. Itchy. You would. Shut up. I'm trying to get the little brat to sleep. You mind? Then what happens? Well... Then, uh, uh, give me that. <clears throat> so all the poor people was happy because, because I wasn't poor now. Yeah, but there's hood guys out 50%. So what? Don't take no for an answer. Look, I have some questions for you, and I'm not leaving the city until they're answered. Yeah, that, that's it. That's good. That's good. I have some questions for you, and you are not leaving this city until they are answered. Yeah, well, I... Okay. Shh. Come with me. What is wrong? 
Oh, it's nothing. I just got something in my eye. You know, my grandpa used to tell me stories about this place as far back as I can remember. I just wish she could be standing here with me. ships with their cargoes of Arcturian solar crystals felt safe and secure. Little did they suspect that they were pursued by pirates. And the most feared of all these pirates was the notorious Captain Nathaniel Flint. And then, gathering up their spoils, vanished without a trace. Ooh. Everyone needs a partner, right? Oh, yeah. I'm not following. Um, well... Hmm. Lungfish! Oh, excuse me? Next Thursday, I'm gonna talk to your class about the lungfish. The closest living relative of the tetrapods. It's, it's, pretty, it's pretty great. Oh, I look forward to hearing it. You know I look forward to all your Thursday lectures. I wish today was Thursday. Oh, I, mean, I know that it's Thursday. I, Don't I just, worry. I, when it's not. It's not a big deal. I wish it was. Here, I should go catch up to my lungfish. I'm in class. Way to go, Maggie. Way to go. I'll see you. A casual passerby when he comes to my table he says hey so what did you work on <laughs> it's like it's like I start reciting the steam is emitting from my ears it's like I'm going on and on and on it's a, it's, like I said it's um, an amazing career uh, to get into animation there's so much the the complexion of the industry has changed so radically since 1973 when I started it's like now the entire globe is one giant animation studio so you know, you, if you're just getting into the industry now or you're thinking about it, now's a good time because there's work coming out of Canada, out of South America, out of Spain, uh, all over the world. So it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty awesome. And even, you know, uh, my family and I, we moved uh, from California out here to Tennessee in 2007. So we're in our 15th year here and the work just kind of followed me. I just, tons of work always. So amazing industry. Um, in, in the um, chronological order, when I started at Disney, I met my two future partners, Don Bluth and Gary Goldman, and um, it became obvious that uh, Disney was kind of in a creative rut. So we left and started our own company in 1979. And our first feature film that we worked on was The Secret of Nim. It featured a single mom by the name of Mrs. Brisby who was taking care of her four children, one of them being very sick and couldn't be moved. So she had to figure a way of moving her son because the next following day, the tractor was going to come in and plow the field. So I'm going to draw Mrs. Brisby for you. Very symbolic about shape. Her ears that sweep back like this. Her mouth. And she has kind of a color separation between down, over, in front of her forehead. So the cheek on the other side. 
sleep on the way from the cheek. She was a very feminine mouse. And we had a great vocal talent by the name of Elizabeth Hartman, who gave real substance to character in this prison. Like in animation, we always say you're only as good as your material. And she gave us some amazing vocal performance that helped us with our animation. Lock of hair, ears, and she wore like a little cake with a smile. And uh, thank you. We worked on that production from 90, we started 19, uh, we started January of 1980 and finished up, I believe, in the spring, late spring of uh, 1982. The film didn't do all that well when it was originally released. We were uh, being uh, uh, distributed by a company called United Artists, MGM United Artists, and they didn't really do a very good job in releasing it and doing the publicity on it. Uh, but it's, over the years, it's gotten quite a fan base. So there's a lot of people that, that love this movie, and one of the people that fell in love with it in its release, and it's, the, I, the irony is that we were up against um, E.T. that year, and nobody saw any other movie that year except E.T. So we felt like the orphan child. But the ironic part is one of the big fans of the movie turned out to be Steven Spielberg. Steven called us and said, I want to come and see you guys. Your film is amazing. I, can't, I, I thought this art form was dead. The fire effects, the water effects, all of the little nuances and minutia is amazing. I want to work on something with you guys. I want to see animation kick up to the next level. I thought it was dead, and it's, you guys are bringing it back to life. Let's do something together. So he came over to our studio. We had a three-hour meeting. We became blood brothers, and my, three, my two partners and myself and him promised that we would be working on something within the next year. So we needed to find a project that we can work on uh, while we were waiting for Steven Spielberg to find that property that we can work together on and collaborate as a production. And sure enough, in, the, in 1983 or late 82, we were um, approached by a game developer in San Diego, a guy by the name of Rick Dyer, who said, I've got this game about this medieval knight that goes into this castle. And there's this new technology called LaserDisc, which allows for random access. And so he can go through the castle, and when he receives it, when he's against a threat, he can either go to the right or the left, or else die. It would make a great game. So we started working on this thing, and it became Dragon's Lair. And Dragon's Lair was amazing. I mean, uh, in the first week or two of its release to arcades, the arcade owners started having lines going out the door, around the block, guys and, and women also standing there with quarters, stacks of quarters ready to play. Um, we, had, uh, we started to promote the game as if it were a theater experience. So we were supplying the arcade owners with posters and billboards and lobby cards and press kits. They were putting velvet cord and ropes going out the door for customers coming in and waiting for their turn to play at any one of the 20 game consoles that they would have in some of these arcades. The only problem is our partners, Cinematronics, did not have a great after-sales service. So what happened is when the game started malfunctioning or breaking down, 
that was it. And so it, for about a year and a half, almost two years, it did extremely well. We followed up with another game called Space Ace, which did equally well. And then right after Space Ace, in the beginning of 1984, we started having these problems with after-sales service, and the whole market just collapsed on us, for us. Uh, but it was a phenomenon for the time. It was an interactive movie, and no one had experienced that. As a matter of fact, the franchise since then has done extremely well for myself and my two partners to the point where we've signed a deal with Netflix. They are now developing a Dragon Slayer movie. Yeah. So um, look out for that. That should be they're they're working on the story. The story has got some uh, very complex components to it. So the first team of writers are absolutely exhausted, and they're waiting for the second team to join them to help them finish the script so we can get into uh, production. Um, so then, in, in 1984, late 1984, we began working with Steven Spielberg. He found the production. He found the product, a book about a immigrant. Uh, family of mice that comes to the United States just as they are finishing the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. So, time to do a Fievel Mouskowitz drawing. <laughs> like this is Brisbane, you know, we do these mice stories. You know, mice become very great subjects for animated film. We start with a circle, and then we start with a sheep. supervising animator on this movie. Um, each one of the partners, Don Bluth, would be directing and designing a lot of the, uh, a lot of the uh, characters. Gary Goldman would be busy doing all the contracting work and a lot of the organizing of production. So each one of the three partners wore different hats. And I was in charge of a lot of the um, supervision of the animation. And so most of the animators would be lined up outside my door, ready for me to see their own steps. And I had to know how to guide them and how to teach them. Whiskers, they tell the baggy hat that his father gave him. that production for about a year and a half and it went so well that uh, uh, Stephen had us over for one of our lunches with him when we were talking about uh, the story and, and how this was finishing up and he started to pitch us an idea for a second feature that he wanted to do with us and this one was based on an original idea. He thought somebody's got to do something about dinosaurs and he wanted to feature a little dinosaur by the name of Littlefoot. And he didn't have an actual story, but he had some, some tentpole moments, some moments that he thought would be visually fun to watch. Uh, and then his George Lucas jumped into the mix and helped us formulate the story that would be The Land Before Time starring a little character by the name of Littlefoot. And it's about this collection of dinosaurs, different dinosaurs that coexist together for their own survival. They're trying to go to this valley that they, that they heard about. And so that became our next feature film that we worked on. And while we were working on it, we decided that um, we, can, we got an invitation from Ireland. Ireland wanted to develop their own animation industry. And they invited us to come to the Emerald Isle and settle in Dublin and be able to employ a lot of their Irish artists that were leaving in droves because there was no art industry in Dublin, Ireland, or in Ireland for that matter. 
And they offered us a great deal, a four or five story building next to the Leffe River across the street from Phoenix Park, one of the largest beautiful parks in Europe, all kinds of tax benefits. So it sounded like a great deal. So 60 members of our company uprooted and moved to Dublin, Ireland. And um, I was there for two years. We worked on um, uh, Land Before Time. We worked on uh, All Dogs Go to Heaven, which you saw a clip of. We worked on, oh my gosh, uh, A Troll in Central Park, um, Thumbelina, uh, Pebble and the Penguin, and Rockadoodle. And all these productions were done by an Irish crew, along with the 60 other uh, American and Canadian crew that helped teach them. And that was, that was an amazing experience. I came back with my wife uh, to California because um, the crew initially agreed that they would be there for two years and then they want to return home. So I had to come back home or else we would have lost a lot of great talent to competing studios. And the industry was starting to grow. Once American Tail came out, it demonstrated an amazing profit potential to all the major studios. Up until that point, it was pretty much Disney and you know Hanna-Barbera and maybe a couple of other smaller commercial studios. Once this came out, this in its opening week, I mean, it was, uh, it, it was uh, I think it opened to 4,000 theaters. It did about 65 to $70 million worth of business in its first domestic release, which was unheard of. Suddenly, Fox, Warner Brothers, Universal, every studio said, we've got to get into that. And so all the other studios jumped in and developed all of their own animation studios. Uh, Curious George, you saw the clip there with uh, Ted and the man in the yellow hat and Maggie. That was Universal Studios. Uh, I worked uh, on Space Jam 2, A New Legacy, Warner Brothers, uh, along with Disney and Fox. My partners left Ireland and they formed their own animation studio with 20th Century Fox doing Anastasia. So animation was becoming huge business and still is. So we owe a lot to the American Tail release. I mean, that we were able to partner with someone as prominent as Steven Spielberg really helped the animation industry and get them on the map. Um, interesting thing about animation is, and I tell my students this, I teach um, animation at Lipscomb Studio, uh, Lipscomb University. It is almost like a studio um, uh, setup. But I tell my students, you ha when you animate a character, you have to become that which you create. So if you're animating a dog character, if you're animating a swordsman, if you're animating a ballerina, you've got to learn some ballet steps. You've got to learn some moves. You've got to learn about the character so you can build that experience in, from the inside out. Otherwise, it won't be authentic and it won't be entertaining. So it's very important that you learn how to act for animation. And it's a very interesting process because um, there'll be things that will influence you that you can use in your animation. And I'll give you a for instance. Um, there was a movie that came out years ago called The Natural with Robert Redford. Do you remember a character that Robert Duvall played? He was the reporter, the cynical reporter named Max Mercy. And every time Robert Duvall would laugh, it's with his tongue, <laughs> like that. I used that in a character in American Tale by the name of Honest John. He was the character that kind of hoodwinked and kidnapped Fievel Mouskowitz and used him as like this slave. Uh, and I used that little acting gimmick in the laughter to help kind of solidify his character, to make him real, to give him substance. So just a little moment, just I wanted to mention that about animation acting. It's one of the things that keeps it alive and exciting for me. Animation never gets boring. When I first decided that I wanted to get in the industry, people are looking at me and saying, why do you want to, why do you want to get into an industry where you're just drawing one Donald Duck after another? Well, that's not what it's about. It's about inventing and giving birth to a life form on paper that you've never seen before. And it's kind of scary because you're thinking, is this going to be entertaining? Is this going to really touch somebody? And the big reward is, you know, being a solitary art form where you're at your board alone a lot of time, 
when you're in the theater and you hear the audience response and you hear somebody crying or laughing at a scene that you've created, there's no other, there's no greater feeling. No greater feeling. It's amazing. Um, so uh, at the end of, we were at, in Dublin, Ireland. I worked with my two partners. I eventually got burned out being a producer and supervising animator. I sold my shares in the company. Kind of went back to painting. So remember, I said I originally wanted to be a background artist. I fell in love with animation, threw away the paintbrushes. Well, now I returned back to painting. And while I was getting ready to have my first show, a dear friend of mine over at Disney by the name of Don Hahn, he was the producer of Beauty and the Beast and Lion King. He said, John, let's go have lunch. <laughs> I want to get you back at Disney. Disney would love to have you back. So Disney, from the time uh, I left with my two partners to that particular time, Disney it was now entering its animation renaissance. They had just had Little Mermaid, big success with Beauty and the Beast, big su success with Aladdin, and now they were doing Pocahontas. And they wanted me to do Captain John Smith. So I had my meeting with Jeffrey Katzenberg, I got wooed, and I went back to Disney back in 1992. And it was really good. Uh, I reconnected with a lot of dear old friends. One of them was uh, a guy, an animator by the name of Glenn Keane. We knew each other there in the 70s. He was in charge of the Pocahontas unit and I was in charge of the Captain John Smith unit. And it was, it was a, a, just a terrific, terrific experience. And being back at Disney, you know, they had uh, grown in such a way where they were reaching out and trying to tell new and different stories. So they weren't in the creative rut anymore. They were really advancing the art form. And one of the pictures I got to work on that my buddy Don Hahn was producing was a movie called Atlantis, The Lost Empire. And it featured a character by the name of Milo Thatch. And um, this is a character, this is probably the closest thing I've ever come to animating a self-portrait. <laughs> so my, my poor wife, she asked me, what time is it, John? And I'll tell her how to make a watch. You know, I get into lots of details. I'm kind of a historical nut. I love history, military history. And I'm just full of all kind of details and facts that nobody really wants to listen to. <laughs> So, so Milo Thatch and I were kind of one in the same cloth, and I had a great vocal performance by Michael J. Fox. And together, uh, the animation crew was uh, in production for about two and a half years. And when you're in a production with two and a half years, you're not just artists anymore, you're family. You get really, really close. You know where everyone is, you go, I mean, all the little habits and you, you just become very close. Um, but that was an interesting production because we had um, our crew shirts said it all, less songs, more explosions. <laughs> so this, um, Gary Trousdale <coughs> and Kurt, Kurt Wise were the directors. They had directed uh, Beauty and the Beast and they wanted to break away from the musical cutesy genre that Disney had developed and become so successful with in the previous eight years. So they wanted to do something a little more hard edge. And what they did is they went out into the industry, comic industry, and they brought in uh, the creator of Hellboy, Mike Mignola. And he helped give us a design universe that we can talk into graphically. It, he brought, he came in for about four months, he kind of redesigned all our environments, our props, our characters. If you go, if you come to our to our booth, we're right close to one of the entrances there. Come to my table, and you'll see a model sheet that we sell. It's the early Milo model sheet, and I kind of loosely patterned that after Nicolas Cage and a couple of other people. Um, and he had a different look than what happened after Mike Mignola's influence on us. And at first, I was very reluctant to draw on that style because I liked the cutesy style with the roundness. This had hard edges to it. After about two months of animating, man, I loved this new approach. So right now, I'm going to do a Milo Thatch drawing. This is kind of a combo I used um, when I was teaching. Um, I was asked to go on a promotional junket 
uh, touring the United States for a little over about a month and a half to Dallas and New York and Brooklyn and, and San Francisco and Salt Lake to promote the film in advance of the release. And I would get up in front of a huge crowd of press and show them how to draw. We would give them little scratch pads so they can learn how to draw Milo. So this is what I taught them. To start off with a, I have a, a shape that looks like a top. Got the eye line, eyes, with nose, eyes, one cock of eyebrow, this cheek line of his jaw. sketches of him, he had a kind of a crooked smile. So I wanted to get that in a little bit. And like I said, we were on that production for about two and a half years. It was, it was kind of a high water mark for me as an animator. It was just not to be duplicated. And it, it just, I still keep in touch with a lot of the guys on Instagram. We, we do posts back and forth. But that was a great experience. And that was followed by um, two friends of mine, John Musker and Ron Clements, had a lot of success being a directing duo. They had done uh, Little Mermaid, Oliver and Company, Hercules, and now they were getting ready to do Treasure Planet. And um, Treasure Pla I got recruited to doing Treasure Planet. They said, they came to one of my art shows. I put on an art show of a lot of my military paintings with cavalry charges and soldiers and muskets and things. And they came and they, they approached me and they said, we saw your battle scenes, man. We would love for you to stage the battle with Captain Flint and his crew raiding this, you know, tourist galleon. And uh, I said, sure, I'd be all up for that. And you saw the clip. Now, I think that was trimmed a little bit because there was a lot more scenes with buccaneers swinging off the yards and, you know, coming on the, on the deck of the, uh, of the pleasure cruiser. I had to go in and design all of my own alien characters. I think there was about 20 or 25. And when you design a character, you'll have multiple passes because it has to be approved by everybody. So even after the directors say, we love that, we gotta show it to the executive producer, he has to love it and everybody has to give their rubber stamp. So there might be, for every pirate character, there might be a dozen different variations of that one character. I had flame throwing characters, I have globby characters, I have insectoid characters, all kinds of different variations of aliens, all kinds. And so uh, finally got it approved and got into animation. And uh, you know, when you're animating crowd scenes, especially guys that are waving swords, it's very challenging because you have to compose the scene for a focal point. Where's your focal point? And then you have to kind of design everything around that focal point. Um, uh, speaking of focal points, if anybody is interested in animation or cartooning or character design, CG animation, please come to my table and take a card and a flyer because we've, uh, we launched our 
animation tutorial site, Pomeroy Art Academy, last year. And we've gotten some good momentum. Uh, I'm just passing on all of the information that I have you know, accrued in the last 50 years. I'm at a point in my career where it's like I would like to pass on my knowledge on to the next generation, and then they hopefully will take it on. I was taught by, as I said before, the nine old men of Disney. They taught me about all the tricks of trade that they had learned when they were working on Snow White, Pambi, Pinocchio, Lady and the Tramp, all those great movies. So I likewise want to pass it on to the next generation. So please come to our table, pick up a card and a flyer, and uh, take a look at our site. Um, so you know, trying to compose a battle scene was really challenging. The next production after that was, um, I believe, Snow Queen. I went on to that for about six months, and uh, I did work on that. Snow Queen eventually became Frozen. That was uh, the Hans Christian Andersen title, Snow Queen. Um, and they started teaching me. Now, Disney thought with some of their productions were not making as much money. The 2D hand-drawn uh, Brother Bear, uh, Home on the Range, uh, were not making as much money as Bugs Life and Toy Story. So. Disney phased out their 2D hand-drawn animation studio, first in Paris, uh, then in Florida, and then finally me in Burbank. So I basically, they didn't renew my, they didn't renew my contract right away. They actually tried to train me in Maya, Maya 1. So this is back in 19, this is 2001, 2002. And they were prepping me to get into the production of uh, Chicken Little. I started to learn, and then they let me go. <laughs> so uh, I went on to production on uh, over at DreamWorks. I was on production for about four or five months on Kung Fu Panda. Had a really good time. I got to meet a lot of great people, a lot of great artists. And then I moved on from there over to Fox Animation, where they recruited me. They needed a Disney artist to do cute little animals with Homer Simpson <laughs> in the little log cabin scene that you saw. So, I mean, it's been an... In Variety has never, you know, uh, been far away from me. There will be all, all kinds of different types of projects. I worked uh, with a story uh, artist for about a year and a half on the movie Planes. That was, I really enjoyed that. I've been working on, I worked on three years of uh, Sophia the First, three years of Fancy Nancy, uh, and just on and on, the Tinkerbell movies. Interesting thing is a lot of people that I had trained early in my career moved on and became producers and directors and turned around and hired me for their work. <laughs> so any of you guys out there, I'd be glad to work for you. Um, and the Tinkerbell movies were great. I did one of the first Tinkerbell movies. Uh, if you follow me on Instagram, um, John Pomeroy Art, um, you'll see some of the posts of things that I did on the Tinkerbell movies and on Sophia the First. One of the interesting things that I worked on the first Tinkerbell movie and I had to kind of help design the character of Silver Mist. And I patterned Silver Mist after my own daughter, Bailey. So every once in a while, I'll post some of the sketches that I used, even some of the animation, because I'm a 2D animator, and the director, Brad Raymond, a friend of mine, he said, could you please do some animation of maybe Silver Mist coming in, turning around, and sitting, because we need to give this information to our digital artist. We don't like the animation they're doing right now. It feels kind of stiff and robotic. And I said, sure, I'll be able to test drive the character for you. So every once in a while, that, that happens. I did a whole section in a Sophia the First sequence. In the last season of Sophia the First, they were featuring a thing called the Mystic Isles. And I did about 50 feet of animation on a character called Prisma, who is this kind of this villain character, and uh, she sings a song called Crystal Clear. So I animated a whole bunch of animation for the direct, at the director's request to give to their CG animators. So let's see what time is. Um, I want to take a moment break to see if there's any questions, because I want to give you guys an opportunity. Yeah. I was going to ask, like, um, during the like, transition from like mainly 2D movies to 3D movies, like, how was that like, like, you know, because I know like in, in the couple of panels you mentioned at the beginning, it was like a 2D scene, you know, 
did they kind of like start minimizing the role of 2D movies until just like completely 3D or so like, you know? You know what, it's interesting. He was just asking a question about the transition between 2D animation and CG animation. Um, first of all, there's plenty of room for both. I mean, I worked on the production last year, uh, Space Jam, A New Legacy, and that had both digital and 2D animation. And it worked together. You can get it to work together. A friend of mine, Sergio Pablos, has developed a, a 2D animation style that you, you call, you, if you watch the movie Klaus, it's hard to tell the difference between that, which is 2D animation, and digital. So they can kind of work together. There's plenty of room for both, though. What's the most important component, though, is the story. Because if the story's working, it doesn't matter if it's CG or, or 2D animation. With a good story, you can tell it in either, you can tell it in 2D animation, you can tell it in sock puppets or clay animation. It really is about the, the, the story and the driving force of it. You might have another question. You might have another question. Sure, go ahead. So like, I'm an artist, not an animator. It's like, I, I've always been interested in it, right? So it's like, I was always like thinking like now, like what you said, Place for both, but like I always see, like they're always going for three D nowadays. What would be like a, you know, what what section of the film industry is like mainly two D now? Like you know, still mainly two D, where it's a lot of opportunity. There, you know. Yeah. There is opportunity, and we try to cover tutorials on my site. We're getting ready to go to California for the big CTN Animation Expo in November. And we're going to be filming a dear friend of mine, Mike Spooner, who is one of our visual development artists, concepts, art, and viz dev on Treasure Planet. And he's going to do a whole course about how to develop con uh, um, uh, concept art. But I mean, there's character design, there's viz dev and, con and concept art, there's actual animation, there's background painting, there's merchandising design, there's game design. So, I mean, it's, so, it, it's exploded with opportunity. I mean, if you love creating environments for the game industry, you know, my, uh, my son, uh, he's an Assassin's Creed addict. So it's like, I watch the gameplay and it's like absolutely amazing, you know, how sophisticated it's getting and more and more texture oriented with all just nuance and minutia. So it's like, you know, sky's the limit. And, it, it, you know, we're, we're getting into a place where it's like, if you want to pitch your own franchise, if you develop your own property, uh, we have uh, one of our tutorials is about all legal aspects of animation is what it's called. The attorney that represented me and my two partners, John Canner, he's been in the industry for 40 years. He gives a lot of tips on how you can protect your own IP your own characters, your properties, your game thoughts, all of your concepts. And uh, it's a good tutorial to take a listen to. So, I mean, and it's always good if you're thinking of starting your own company. You know, it's hard to do it alone. If you've got a, a partner or two, fantastic. I, I was graced to have two partners who shared my dream and my passion as much as I did. So, anyway, hope that answers your question. Any other thoughts? Yes. Uh, do you ever? I want to bring up the, the fact that you put background details, like you know, background details. Have you? Uh, is there a character that you made that has some, like a story himself in, in the background, like like the character that you made? A background character, like that has its own personality and all that. That basically you, in your own, it has its own story. That, <laughs> that is the main character. This, this, now this this represents, I think, the answer because uh, what you want to do is make sure that when the vocal performance and the animation come together and they marry each other, it becomes real. People buy into it. They don't buy. They, they won't necessarily buy into the story right away, but they will buy into the character and they'll root for that character. Once that happens, you're taking them on a ride. And that's what happened here. So this was the perfect combination of design sense, acting for animation, vocal performance with Michael J. Fox, and then all of the other things that, that amplify that, the color, the music, the sound effects. Because you tell, you tell an animation story in various layers. You tell it in color then Hans Zimmer will come in and tell it music. 
And then background artists will come in and enhance it with details of the environments. And then you have the animation acting itself. You've got cleanup artists that clean up the rough drawings that also enhance it. So all of these things come together and they make for a total experience that you buy into. And what we call it is the willing suspension of disbelief. Do I believe that that character is alive and real? And if I do, then I'm taken into a story and an adventure for two hours and I'm taken into another universe. It's a good question, thank you. Thank you. Any others? Any, yes? So uh, we talked a bit of pride, I really appreciate hand-drawn, sketched over CG. The CG's come a long way. Is CG really faster and cheaper and what is the starting salary for an animator? Oh boy, I think so. Starting salary, I, I, my guesstimate, uh, I'm, I'm guessing somewhere between uh, 1,000, 1,200 a week. I don't know. It all depends on the production and the, how deep the pockets are of the production company. And it's not necessarily any easier. You know, I get that from a lot of CG artists. Um, it's, 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 I'm not going to say it's a lie, but going 2D can sometimes be even cheaper than CG. CG can be very time consuming. I'm having a simple rig built of my mascot character, Tig, the little saber-toothed tiger character that's on our marquee at our booth. It's taking forever, and I've got two guys working on it. And I'm going, I'm going at the budget approach. So I know not necessarily is an answer to the economy of animation, doing it better or quicker or cheaper. 2D can be just as cheap. And it's funny, um, Warner Brothers, for instance, has probably eight different 2D productions that I have been involved in in the last two years. There's been a Scooby-Doo project. I am working on um, the day the earth blew up with Morky and Daffy, uh, and on and on and on. I mean, I've worked on a lot of, you know, Looney Tunes and, and on and on. So there's a lot of 2D productions out there, and hopefully there'll be more. There's plenty, there's plenty for everybody, you know, whether you're digital, 2D, Claymation, whatever it is. Any others? Yes. So I noticed in some of your earlier works that the, uh, the motion of the characters do is more exaggerated than what you want. Yes. Right. Okay. And that's to convey emotion or what the, the tone that the person is giving. And so, how, like, I know whenever you're going to draw, then you watch the voice actor and listen to the tone and kind of make a decision on what you want to exaggerate. Yeah, I mean, the, uh, the question is about uh, what do you choose to exaggerate if you're watching the voice actor? Now, with Pocahontas, we filmed live action actors and actresses of the whole movie that we use as a reference for the animation. Reference. And I, I want to make that clear. It's not, we're not tracing the uh, live action. We're using it as a reference. There's nothing more difficult to animate than a human character because we're so used to seeing uh, humans around us moving. And if we're all off by a single degree, you'll catch it and we'll ruin that willing suspension of disbelief. You'll forget, you'll, you'll lose interest because it'll be boring to you and it won't work. So we have to make sure that those movements, the locomotion of the human characters are working correctly. So when you see Frozen, when you see Pocahontas, when you see Tangled, or any other human character featured in animated films, you want to make sure that it's correct and it looks real, it's authentic. Even animal characters, if you're watching Poe in Kung Fu Panda, the weight, the way it's distributed on that character works. As a matter of fact, it's written into the story, so it's funny. But it has to be authentic. It has to be real. So we kind of pick and choose the things that we want to exaggerate because animation is the art of exaggeration. We take an idea, you know, if the character is reaching for something and it's, the action is only this much, we may amplify it to words like that much. If the character is turning his head from this to this, we may want to put an anticipation and a quick turn and adjust the timing and make it a little more spontaneous and a little more quicker. So we'll use live action reference as a basis and then take it beyond. That's what you want to do as an animator. Any other questions? 
It's yes. Oh, I was gonna ask like to start an image. I know it's different than like back in whenever you started, but like what would be like the career path? Like like what would you have to I know you have to set up like a resume and have prior works and stuff like that, but it's like is the degree necessary? Is like the you No. Know, the I don't have a degree. I'm teaching, I'm an I'm a artist in residence at, at Lipscomb University. No, you don't need a degree, but you do need a portfolio. The basis of a good portfolio is sketching. Please sketch. If you're interested in getting in the industry, go to the zoo, sketch. Go to the mall, sketch people in action, sketch attitudes. We have a tutorial on our my tutorial series, Pomeroy Art Academy, that's hosted by Ron Husband, one of the first African-American uh, supervising animators at Disney. He, he was in charge of the character Doc Sweet in Atlantis Lost Empire. He does a whole tutorial about sketching and the importance of learning how to sketch quickly. Because you got to be able to put down the attitude and form fast. You become like a reporter with a pencil. So I, sketching is kind of the basis for all of this. And then you just build on top of that life drawings, uh, landscape drawings and paintings, on and on and on. I'm going to let you guys go. It's been wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. It's been terrific. Thank you. <laughs>